piling in. Uh, single file, please. No tripping, no falling. Um, got a good program set out here for you today. So uh, we'll just give everybody a couple of minutes here uh, to get in. Uh, if you need a quick bio break, if it is quick, you will have time because we'll start here about two minutes after and it's now top of the hour. So just stay tuned, everybody. And uh, if you are not on mute, you can mute yourself here just uh, to avoid any background noise and we will uh, get started in a couple minutes. Greg, you can put the slides up if you'd like, if you want to share. Oh, I'll put them up in two, <clears throat> two seconds. I'll be, uh, Greg and I discussed that I'd be doing the uh, slides. Okay, just, just two seconds. So you've got a couple more folks to join us. We're going to get started here in just a moment. So stay with us, uh, just letting... We're expecting a couple more folks to, to jump in here. So one more minute and we will get started. All right, looks like we're just creeping up on 1102. Uh, if you've got those slides, Paul, you can. Yes, there. There we go. Perfect. All yeah, right. Just, uh... Great. Okay, perfect. I can see those, Paul. They look good. Um, so thank you, everybody, again, for joining us here today on our What's Next presentation. I think you're going to find uh, it's a pretty cool one today. We've got uh, two folks I'll introduce in just a moment joining us. Uh, but I want to thank you for taking time out of your busy day to jump on. Hopefully, we can share with you a few tips, ideas, and strategies that you can deploy uh, with your own organization following today. There is a, uh, well, I guess there's two ways you can connect or communicate if you'd like. There's a chat box at the bottom, as you already know, and there's a Q&A box or tab, if you will. Feel free to use whichever you prefer. Throughout the presentation, I will have my camera off, but I'm in the background monitoring, and I will facilitate the Q&A. Uh, with both Greg and Paul here at the end of their presentation. So Q&A works a little bit better. It allows me to check and make sure I've done them, but whatever you're comfortable with, we're here to serve. So with that said, let me jump into today's presentation. It's all about carbon mitigation as a competitive advantage. And as you see on the slide in front of you, next Thursday, we will have a roundtable discussion. If there's interest, uh, where, where possible Greg and Paul will join us again. But the whole point is to give you an opportunity to have dialogue. Oops, we went, there you go. To have some dialogue around today's topic. So if it gets to Q&A and not all your questions are, are answered or you'd like to have further discussion, make sure you join us next Thursday, March 25th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. I will be sending out a recording of today's presentation. And in that, I will be asking you if you'd like to attend. If you do, simply hit reply. Uh, to say yes, and then I will send you the link early next week as we get closer, okay? So that's what's coming up for you next Thursday. Uh, so before we uh, get going here today, just let me introduce our speakers. So first we have Greg Zilberbrandt. So Greg is the principal at JBI Environmental Consulting and program lead for Circular Economy and Carbon Mitigation at McMaster University. Say that three times fast, I dare you. Greg earned his PhD from McMaster University and prior to starting his own consultancy, he spent over a decade in various technical and leadership roles in the steel and cement industries, focused on environmental performance, climate change strategy, and byproduct synergies. His complementary professional pursuits involved the development of the circular economy and carbon mitigation professional certificate program that is at McMaster University today, and of obviously supporting Canada's role in the development of the ISO standard for circular economy. So very accomplished gentleman to join us here today. So Greg, thank you. And also we have Paul. So as you know, in our what's next presentations, when we bring to you a, you know, what's next thought leadership series, we always like to bring forward people who are actually doing this, right, who can speak to the value. So we're very fortunate today to have Paul join us. Uh, Paul Rack, he's the president and owner of Veriform Incorporated, a metal fabrication company in Cambridge, Ontario. Um, Paul opened Veriform nearly 25 years ago. Uh, he was five at the time. Uh, and he's created additional ventures in the metal fabrication industry, including a, including a laser cutting company and a new division within Veriform called Veracut, 
which is exclusively focused on building downdraft tables for larger equipment manufacturers, sh like shipbuilders, nuclear laser waste disposal systems, and helicopter guidance systems. So all very complex, obviously. Um, so Paul has joined us, and the reason Paul is joining us is he obviously has connected with Greg. They know one another. I think they've done some strategizing and work together, and Paul is going to bring to life some of these concepts as to how he's doing this in his facility today. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to you gentlemen to uh, take over. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sean. Thanks for that, uh, that kind introduction. So uh, thanks everyone for joining us. And, and, and my intention here um, is that uh, they're going to present things on a, uh, on a higher level, because obviously we have got Paul, who is going to speak to the, uh, the details of, of how, what this looks like on the ground, especially for a, um, for an SME. So um, just to give you a, some sense of the, of the context, um, you know, my background coming from, from large industry and looking at these strategies from a large industry standpoint, understanding that part of that role is always working with smaller um, enterprises to support um, those large organizations. So the other side of that is, of course, the academic side, whether that be in research and my own research um, or in the educational aspect of it in the traditional undergraduate or graduate form or professional training and bringing those elements together and seeing it from a different lens. So what I'm hoping to share with you today are, are those perspectives um, at, at a high level. Um, and so and then letting Paul get into uh, the details of what it looks like on the ground. Uh, one of the things I'm not going to spend time on is obviously the um, the policy aspect, climate change impact, um, and, and not because it's not important, but um, obviously we've got an hour and we want to get to to some of these uh, notions that are very applicable to you. Um, so if you're following the news or if you're following anything that is related from an environmental standpoint or a policy standpoint, uh, you can very much appreciate uh, the impact of climate change, the impact of carbon regulations. Um, and I imagine that you're here today as a result of that, uh, of that knowledge. So the first place I wanna start is the, this, the, what you may or may not know already is the influence of small and medium-sized enterprises in Canada. Um, and you can see that with the small ones representing about 70%, another 20% coming from medium, um, this is a major uh, employer um, in the private sector. And one of the things I wanna do is drive from that is you know, what, what does that mean from an implications on a greenhouse gas um, standpoint? We can see it's obviously a major employer uh, in Canada, an important one uh, representing nearly 90% of employees uh, in Canada. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. So where I want to focus is obviously with uh, next generation um, manufacturing is obviously the manufacturing sector. You can see that um, maybe maybe logical, maybe not, but obviously there's a lot of uh, retail and a combination of food industry employees that are in small enterprises. But uh, what I've highlighted for you here is also the construction and manufacturing side. So you can see they're uh, fairly similar in terms of the employees and you can see the representation in the small, so less than hundred employees uh, in those two, two sectors of the economy. So again, uh, just reemphasizing important sector of the economy. So uh, if you didn't know that already, if you're an SME, you're an important sector of the Canadian economy, an important part of um, the employment force for Canada. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. So what does this all mean from a uh, greenhouse gas standpoint? Now, this is a breakdown of the greenhouse gas emissions in terms of CO2 equivalents uh, in Canada. So when we talk about CO2 equivalents, for those of you haven't heard that term before. Um, essentially, it's all the greenhouse gas emissions converted to a, um, a CO2 value. So different, different emissions um, and different compounds have different impacts when it comes to climate change and global warming potential. This is all put on one scale in terms of CO2 equivalent, um, CO2 being the value one and others carrying higher values depending on how they react in the atmosphere and their global warming potential. Um, and you hear a little bit about that when you talk about methane, methane having um, a higher impact on global warming. Um, what we do here is we convert it all to an equivalency factor so we can look at it as one number. And what we see here is the various um, sectors of our economy. And one of the things I wanna point you to is that for, for the SMEs that the actual representation is about 30% of the national total coming from SMEs, which is not shown on this graph. And the reason it's not is because it's spread out throughout, right? Um, I, obviously you can appreciate uh, your, whether you're using heavy, whether you're in the heavy industry, you are in a building, you're transporting goods, uh, you're using electricity, all those things play into different parts of this pie graph. But if we add those things together, SMEs represent about 30% of our national total. So keeping in mind 
that when we talk about 30%, that's the same as our commitments when it comes to 2030 and Paris Agreement. So um, it's, it's, not a, uh, it's not a small amount that SMEs uh, represent when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. Next slide, please, Paul. So the, uh, the important thing to highlight, and I think this is sometimes uh, what we, we like to get into understanding, which is the full scope of the impact. Um, I appreciate this is going to be recorded, so you can pause a moment and read the uh, comments that I, I've left for you on the left-hand side, which is from the Global Reporting Initiative, and the breakdown of various areas where impact actually occurs. So here, what I want to highlight is this concept of life cycle assessment and actually understanding where impacts occur in the entire supply chain. Um, this is a report from the World Business Council for Sustainable Development from last year. They actually highlighted a few industries um, on a very macro level. You can see the consumer products uh, and food, which are the two I'm gonna focus on first. And you can see that, um, so scope one, scope two, and scope three. What that means is scope one is essentially what you do. Everything that you own, everything that you um, operate within your control. Uh, scope two is your purchased electricity. So those are things that is essentially you buying electricity from the grid. And scope three, which is really important, is your supply chain and your customers. So this is all of the impact from the materials that feed your products or feed your business. So you can appreciate now, if we look at that from a logical standpoint, if you look at consumer goods uh, in our everyday life, obviously, uh, whether that be biological consumer goods or you're coming from some sort of natural environment or a process, there's a lot of um, impact from the downstream um, carbon footprint. Uh, if we think of agriculture, for example, there's a huge down, uh, downstream footprint um, from, sorry, upstream footprint from the suppliers that are feeding your production. They're the ones that are actually carrying the burden. So uh, when you're finally processing and, and packaging those things up, they might have a lesser impact. Uh, food is in the same boat. Um, as you can appreciate from steel, for example, steel, um, we have that at the end. That's the process itself, right? So, so what actually happens in the steel plant carries a lot of the impact. The power and utility sector, interesting, is mostly from the downstream. So that's the customers actually using it. Um, and same with oil and gas. So you see that that's the, the consumer production, um, both upstream and downstream that have an impact, uh, whereas the operation is not as impactful as something like steel. So we can see that uh, between this, and we're not breaking this down into, into a lot of detail, um, and we can really kind of dissect this and see how much of it is from suppliers, how much of it is the customer use, for example, oil and gas. Um, once, you put the oil, once you put the gasoline in your car, that's where a lot of the emissions occur. So what we're not talking about is exactly how this breaks down, but what we can see is that your supply chain um, and your customers have an impact on the overall carbon footprint. Uh, now, this becomes really important when we talk about life cycle assessment because it becomes part of the discussion with your potential customers and, and the carbon footprint that's carried from your products or your processes into their uh, products or processes when we're looking at this um, as an overall output. So um, I'm gonna come back to carbon footprint and in terms of how you can use that. But one of the things that I want to highlight here um, is obviously just looking at your, your fence line is important, uh, but looking beyond your fence line is critically important uh, and especially depending which industry you're in. Um, the impacts outside your fence line could be, uh, you know, quite significant even relative to your own operation. The one thing I want to mention when we talk about life cycle assessment, when we talk about carbon footprinting. Um, if you've got a process flow diagram, if you've got a process flow um, throughout your organization, throughout your production facility, um, you can probably make quite a um, good run at completing a carbon footprinting exercise in your facility. So um, I think that it might sound daunting to think about the concept of life cycle assessment, but um, it is a very well thought out process now and actually um, quite accessible um, to organizations across the spectrum, not just large organizations that might have a specialist that focuses on this. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. So the other tool that I wanted to show you, and I appreciate this is a bit of an eye test, uh, so I don't expect you to read the details here. Uh, but this is what's called a marginal abatement cost curve. So my intention here is to introduce a couple of tools to you that I think would be quite valuable. Um, and a marginal abatement cost curve um, essentially outlines where your projects fit relative to the cost that you would incur to implement them versus the amount of reduction they would achieve. So if we think of something like a marginal abatement cost, it's exactly what it sounds like. 
how much would it cost to remove a unit of a pollutant? Uh, in this case, we're talking about carbon, but a unit of a pollutant um, or from, um, from essentially being released. So in this case, what we're able to do is a lot of this work you're doing already. Um, and you're gonna hear from Paul and you know, Paul's uh, obviously passion to, to drive this change as the owner and the president of this company uh, is fantastic. For those of you who are working in companies where you're communicating this and, and selling this to individuals who are gonna be making the decision, um, there is a financial element that you can bring into that discussion and an order in which you can present information on carbon reductions um, to achieve those goals. So it, it's not, there isn't a dichotomy between you know, making the, the financial calculations and calculating the carbon input. You can actually do them um, jointly and, and Paul will show you that later on in terms of the cost savings. Uh, but you can also determine which projects make sense and in which order they make sense. Um, so I, I won't dwell on this too much, but simply to say that, it, again, you're probably doing the work already to calculate the benefits of your projects. You've probably got the information, you know, um, at least in part in your facilities and your organizations to calculate carbon footprint. And if not, there are lots of resources to be able to do that. Um, and now you can start putting those pieces together as to what makes sense for you to implement and in which order to drive those carbon reductions. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. So... The one thing um, that, that we talk about, um, and I think it's important to highlight um, and, and kind of not beat around the bush is that, um, you know, carbon reduction alone um, in, in any organization is not going to uh, get us to some of the targets that we have beyond 2030 in terms of a net zero environment uh, for, for carbon emissions, uh, whether that be in Canada or on a global basis. So uh, of course, carbon avoidance um, and, and carbon removal are, are critically important. So what we're talking about um, carbon avoidance is obviously you know, the avoiding releasing that emission. Um, the carbon removal is what we talk about when we hear about um, carbon capture, utilization, and storage. So whether that be uh, mineralized in sort of some mineralized environment where we're injecting into the ground, uh, whether that be um, some work that's being done now with direct air capture technologies, uh, or whether that be natural sequestrations with trees or um, any other biological matter. So there are uh, opportunities for carbon removal, um, and that comes with a strategy that is really built into how you want to reach that carbon neutrality. So there are carbon credits available. You can buy the projects that are being done. Um, there's always going to be, and I, I don't want to say that you know every organization is going to be able to get to zero. I don't know. I don't think that's a realistic statement. Uh, when I say zero, an absolute zero, where everything that you do is run completely from uh, with a zero carbon footprint. Um, there are industries where, um, at least in the foreseeable future, we are going to have to find a way to balance that with carbon neutrality through carbon removal projects. So there is a balance, um, and, and at least in, even right now, you can, you can make that decision um, and you can, go, you can become carbon neutral today. Um, there are credits available, and Paul will talk to you about this as well. There are carbon credits available uh, for facilities to become carbon neutral. And it doesn't stop you from doing all those other projects to drive down and avoid the carbon in the first place. Um, next slide, please, Paul. Uh, so I, I, the other piece that we, we have to be mindful of is this emergence of a concept of a circular economy. And this is where we're seeing a lot of small organizations actually had taken the lead. Large ones are, of course, um, finding synergies and especially byproduct synergies uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, when they've got facilities or they own multiple parts of a supply chain, they're able to define those synergies. But we do see that disruptive innovation in, in smaller organizations. And the idea of a circular economy is this move to a service-based economy. Um, the idea that we're able to now move uh, in a direction where we need to understand the services being provided, how we utilize materials, how we reuse materials, what is available um, in the marketplace in terms of raw materials, and, and as Sean mentioned in my intro, that was one of my, uh, one of my roles in larger industries to understand what raw materials or byproducts were available um, for production, as well as what byproducts were available um, after production, and, and how can we commoditize all of it uh, to make sure that we have customers at, at, at the end of all of, these, um, all of these processes. So there is really an opportunity in a, in a circular economy, and the reason I bring this up is this is where um, a lot of the sustainability discussion and, and a tie to carbon mitigation is, is uh, taking place. So 
the larger organizations, maybe some of your customers or, or um, some of your partners are hearing about these things and, and they're gonna be seeing the pressure from a policy standpoint to implement some of these uh, opportunities. And I think that with small and medium-sized enterprises, the ability to, to pivot and move quickly actually creates great opportunity in this different approach of a, uh, a service-based um, economy where there is more focus on maintaining longevity on providing a service over specifically a product and maintaining that customer relationship for a long period of time. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. Uh, so this is another uh, example, and this is actually a recent report from Circle Economy that came out in, uh, just earlier this year. And one of the reasons I wanted to bring this up is I wanted to touch on um, those service providers because I appreciate we have manufacturers here, but we also have professional uh, services organizations that are here. And one of the areas, and we, we talked about this for years in terms of, you know, can we fly less, can we drive less? I think, you know, right now in COVID, I don't know if that's, um, you know, a popular topic. I think we'd all like to, to be able to get out of our houses and, and do something. Um, but obviously, the, the less that we can do in, in that regard um, reduces the impact um, in, in, a, in a logical sense. Right? We do less of that with, and for the benefit of society overall. But what you'll see in, in this, and again, I'll, I'll, I'll encourage you to pause it um, when, with the recorded version, is you'll see um, in some of these large um, areas of reduction, both from a material standpoint and a climate change standpoint, that there is an optimization that is taking place. So for those professional services, um, you know, shared workspaces or how we use space, uh, modularity, how we build things that are able to be reused, how we uh, maximize the utilization of our transportation fleets. So all of those things that are an efficiency um, that, that comes naturally in a business environment are actually um, resonating and, and taking hold in both the circular economy discussion and the climate change discussion. So it, it's, not, um, it's not disassociated. So there is lots of opportunity um, to be able to offer um, that type of service. And, and this is the area where some of your customers or some of your stakeholders are going to be looking uh, for support, especially from agile organizations that are able to pivot. And, and of course, small, uh, medium-sized organizations are, are able to do that much faster than large organizations. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. So um, I'm going to leave you with a few key takeaways because I want to uh, have Paul present uh, kind of the, the boots on the ground of what, what's, what's possible when you put your your mind and your time and your effort and your passion behind it. Um, so one thing I would encourage you is understand where your impact is. So completing a life cycle assessment, um, which is again, not as daunting as it sounds anymore. Um, it, there is complexity to it, but when we talk about it from a carbon standpoint, um, there's actually, uh, it's actually quite straightforward now based, with, based on the resources that are available. This is gonna be important to you, but it's also gonna be important to your customers, especially those who are now looking at their entire life cycle and their impact of their products or services across life cycles. So if you're a supplier, they're gonna be interested in what your impact is. And when we get into things like sustainable procurement, when, they're, when decisions are being made based on the impact of a purchase, uh, especially when we talk about large scale purchases, that's now going to create a competitive advantage if you can demonstrate that A, you're able to calculate this and B, you can um, show yourself as being uh, moving in the right direction relative to your competitors. Um, plan your carbon reductions like any other project. Um, the, you know, you've already have a lot of this information, the financial information before you move forward on projects. You're able to capture that carbon information, use that and plan it the way you plan any other project. This is not uh, their project management approach. Um, the, the things that you need to do, the way they need to think about these things is no different than you would for any other project. So, so be logical about it, use the same skill sets that have um, allowed you to succeed in your businesses already, uh, but apply it to, to a, uh, climate change and carbon lens. Um, look at cir circular economy opportunities. So again, the service economy and byproduct synergies uh, that I mentioned, and, and you know, how can you create things with um, either byproducts, how can you provide a service instead of a good that will obviously benefit your customers and, and possibly open up new customers who are looking for those solutions. Uh, the carbon neutrality piece, and I have a comment there, which is find the solution or be the solution. Uh, and obviously part of that is that as this demand for this grows, there's going to be a need to, uh, for organizations who have reached their limit of reduction to find their offsets elsewhere. So 
those who are not part of the carbon markets now, your ability to actually enter those markets and, and provide solutions or provide credits to those uh, who need them or really kind of service that sector. So it's, it's, it's becoming, a it's going to be, and it has already, but it will, it's a market in itself and it's an opportunity in itself uh, to drive down emissions and then obviously uh, open up those credits to the market. Um, and of course, finding the solution is through those uh, carbon offsets, the, either in um, a biological standpoint or um, in, a, in a sort of mineralization or in uh, carbon capture utilization and storage standpoint. Um, the final thing I would leave you with, and I, you know, I put my master hat on here for a second, but utilize available resources. Um, you know, obviously with NGEN and the training that, that they're um, able to support uh, and offer through their uh, AMPOP program, um, you can gain a lot of these skills to be able to take it back to your organizations and actually create that change. Um, and the other thing is students. Um, there are lots of students who are interested in this. I can share with you um, that you know, my students who are in my grad class um, all know how to complete a life cycle assessment. It's something they have to do uh, to, to complete my class. So they're very well versed in uh, how to do these things. So there are students out there in academic institutions who are looking for real life projects, real life experience. Um, so don't think that there's a financial barrier just because you're a small and medium sized enterprise that you can't access that resource and, and have some of this initial legwork, this, this lift uh, done, this heavy lift, if you will, done for you to get you to a point where you can start down that path. Um, so the last thing I'll share with you is this, this, this short quote um, that obviously in many ways without the scale and complexity of larger companies, SMEs are an advantage, they can pivot faster and implement carbon reduction measures more quickly and cheaply. Uh, and I think that that is uh, very true. And I think that Paul will, will demonstrate that uh, for you. So I'll, I'll pause there and I'll flip it over to Paul. I think I'm exactly 25 minutes, Sean. Well, thank you. Thank you, Greg. And thank you, Sean, for uh, uh, allowing me to join this. So first of all, I'm really excited. I've, I've seen uh, the list of uh, attendees and the titles, and uh, I think I, I have to really work hard on this one to make sure that uh, the, the, the sort of the big uh, picture people here uh, I'm giving you actually good data. So I'm going to sort of work hard for the next 25 minutes. My name is Paul and I, I own Veriform and Vericut in Cambridge. Uh, this is our 25th year in business and we're very numbers focused. That's why my presentation will be about uh, the numbers. Uh, I'll stress that over and over again during the presentation. Now I'll come back to some of the points that Greg was making, like the, the byproduct synergies. And Here's our plant. Uh, this is the office here, and to the right is my uh, my my Prius. That was my earliest earliest uh, car uh, at Veriform. Um, here is the plant uh, with you can see the two bays. On the right is the uh, light blue uh, bay that was built in 1982, and on the left you'll see the the bay that was built in 2006. What you'll see here, there's nothing special about our building. If you were to drive by our facility here in Cambridge. There would be nothing that would make us stand out, but I'm hoping that when you, when I tell you the story, you'll see that there's a lot going on here that uh, makes a, a, us a, a very good example of how sustainability can uh, boost our profits and uh, really reinforce our our, our uh, company against uh, bad times. Here's a, a visual from the from the Google. You can see that new bay I was talking to you about. That's a little darker blue. The roof is white, and uh, that was was built in 2006. Here's uh, our first 37 projects we did. Uh, when I say projects, I mean uh, things like uh, changing the lights or things like uh, putting in uh, systems to reduce uh, heat loss. Uh, now, there, there's, there's 37 here. Greg and I are working with one of his uh, postgraduate students on documenting over 100 uh, projects we've done. And I'll get that number again later on, the uh, over 100 number. But when you look at this uh, chart here, what I want to stress is when I look at all the names of people who are attending today, uh, you're up from many different sectors, and I'm a manufacturer, so I want to make sure that you understand that what we're doing here is scalable into institutions, uh, into um, education, into commercial buildings, um, not just manufacturing. And here I've highlighted all the projects that were done in our offices, as an example. So you can see on these first 37 projects, uh, I'm not sure if this, this slide has all 37 on here, but the majority actually were in the office. So please, when you're listening uh, to me talk today, remember that what we're doing here is scalable and it's applicable to every type of industry. 
uh, whether it be uh, commercial buildings uh, to, to universities, hospitals, uh, cities, it really is scalable to all those different divisions. Uh, I'm going to touch on these five topics. I won't have any more slides with bullets other than this one. This one you'll see at the end. I'll actually be putting numbers. I'll be putting numbers on how much we uh, uh, increased our jobs, job creation, how much more competitive we were, are now, uh, what our um, growth has been, uh, how much we're saving on maintenance. I'll touch on all these five, uh, five items at the end. So I actually have five divi sorry, three divisions. Caliber looks after our mining. Uh, Veriform is uh, all, most of our other customers, and Vericut is the downdraft tables we do for large uh, steel service centers all across uh, the United States and Canada. Here is the new bay. You can see it's uh, very clean and new with all the T5 lighting that was put in. We haven't put in T, uh, LED lights yet, but that's a, another step we could take at our facility. Um, you can see at the left is a, the blue structure there that was uh, for uh, uh, one of the nuclear plants in Ontario for waste disposal. This is a, a couple of uh, transition systems for uh, Labrador, for a mine up in Labrador. Here's an emergency trailer. So if you're, if you're in Ontario and you were coming down the road and it was closed off and you saw a trailer with lights saying emergency road closure, very high probability it was built here at my company. Here we built uh, some structures for uh, the CN rail down by the, the CN tower. So if you were going up the CN tower and then looking down uh, at the lake, to your left and to your right is CN rail running along. Lakeshore. Well, we built all the, the enclosures and structures that hide or, or basically make it a little, little more cosmetically positive to look at. So here's two employees installing these covers. This is a fascinating one and goes back to the uh, byproduct synergies that Greg was mentioning. Uh, we also have built uh, uh, silos for um, uh, taking manure and uh, creating energy and electricity from it. These silos were just up before installation. They're actually installed later uh, in the vertical position. But the farmers put the manure into these silos. Uh, they put in bacteria, and the silos ferment the, the, the manure and the methane, which comes off naturally. You know, if you've ever gone, gone by a farmer's field in the spring or, or even in the fall, you often smell the pungent smell of manure. Well, these, that's, that's the methane you're smelling. And these, these uh, silos actually take that methane, and, and they, they burn that to create electricity. And uh, I find it fascinating for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, that methane is, is totally eliminated. Uh, methane is, is far worse than uh, CO2. So the farmers are creating electricity 24 hours a day, uh, whereas wind and solar are intermittent. Whereas uh, these, these, these farms, this one was enlistable, they're creating that energy 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and then all year round. This is fascinating. I think this one was creating at least six, six megawatts, which is incredible for a small facility. Now, the farmer, uh, when he takes the manure and it's done, he puts it on his field. Nobody can actually smell anything on the field. Well, the neighbor actually reported the farmer to the Ministry of Environment saying, my farmer, my farmer neighbor is putting on manure on his field and there's no smell. I don't know what's going on. And they came out and they found out it was this manure that had, had, uh, had no methane, methane left in it. And also there was no weeds, seeds, in the, the manure because it's so hot, you can't even put your hand on the, the silos. The bacteria are fermenting that, that manure at such a temperature that uh, there is, uh, the seeds are killed and the farmer has to use less pesticide, almost no pesticide on the field. So fantastic. The, uh, the University of Guelph is even taking the CO2 that's uh, created from the burning of the methane and they're creating algae ponds. So that would be a complete circular uh, uh, a method or system here of uh, you consuming all that uh, GHG gas. Here's our downdraft tables. Up in the top, you can see Dave standing. This one we installed in uh, Minnesota, and this is a for a Tanaka laser at one of the oldest uh, steel service center companies publicly traded in the United States. So in 1997, we opened our doors, and I, I, I built my company on uh, Deming's uh, quality principles. If you know Deming, Deming was the one who really started the quality movement in Japan, and then it was brought over back to the United States and Canada. Um, a lot of his, uh, his methodology is about measuring. Um, that's why the numbers are so important to us. We make our decisions based on numbers. Um, so, for example, point 11, eliminate arbitrary numerical targets. Uh, and across all these 14 categories, measuring is very important. So 2006-2007 is really when we started our initiatives, and I think 
when you see the numbers, you're really going to be excited yourselves. 2006, 2007, three things happened. One, I saw Al Gore's movie, uh, The Inconvenient Truth. My daughter was born, and I bought a Prius. Those three things really uh, happened in a matter of just three months. And I thought, you know, I've got to do some things at my company, not from a financial savings perspective, but just to reduce our emissions. Uh, so we had our, our carbon footprint analyzed, and we started to uh, attack different things. The first project was one of the best and most successful ones, and it's, it's quite easy, natural gas. Uh, natural gas, even though we're a manufacturer, is that uh, we're using a lot of electricity, natural gas is actually the biggest uh, CO2 uh, uh, cause uh, for emissions. So here you can see our emissions. In January 2005, we were using uh, 27 cents of natural gas per square foot. And I've got four bay doors on the west side of my building and another bay door on the other end. And we were having about four trucks a day from National Steel Car down in Hamilton. Uh, they're building all the rail cars and they would drop off two trucks of steel every day and then they would also pick up two trucks full of product. Now in the winter time those bay doors you saw were open up to four hours a day and I would actually bring a six thousand dollar invoice out to the shippers and say guys is there no way you can bring those trucks inside so we can close the door and they always said Paul no we can't uh, I'm sorry about that but the, there's no room in the shop. Then there was also thermostats I installed. I tried to control the, the heat loss by installing thermostats. Um, they even put uh, tamper-proof lids on them and the staff broke the, the, the uh, lids off. You don't mess with people's temperature. And then, uh, then there was even programmable ones that I had installed, but in the old bay, there was, they were not programmable at all. So people would just uh, play with those as they wished. So the bay door, the one day I actually just said, I've had enough, we're gonna find a solution. So up in the top left, sorry, top right corner of the, the bay door, I'm going to zoom in here, I, I installed uh, these little limit switches. That little diagonal arm there, when the door opens, the diagonal arm uh, turns and it turns off the heat. Um, now, in one month, we went from uh, $6,000 um, and to, sorry, go back to here, $6,000 down to $570 the following month. I'm going to show you a chart in a second. And also those seven thermostats in the shop, I cut the cables to all of them and installed one thermostat in the office that you could lock. So here it was before, and here's after for comparison. You can see the dramatic drop. It was over 90% less usage. Uh, it was incredible. Uh, I had one person tell me, well, Paul, yes, you're comparing two same months here but um, six years apart, maybe it was uh, climate change. Has, it's gotten warmer. Uh, you can actually look up. You can look up the, the temp mean temperature. The mean temperature for January 2005 was minus 6.7. For 2011, it was minus 7. So it definitely wasn't climate change that was uh, causing the savings. It was those those doors. Now, what's even more fascinating is 2005 was when I had the old building only. I didn't have the new addition. So you can see with the new addition. Even with a new addition and add extra space, uh, we're, we're still con uh, conserving uh, energy here. 2011, the building, it was already in place for four years. Uh, an opportunity for anybody here. I, I, if I had time, I would commercialize the bay door system. We've got it set now where it actually sets the temperature back. It doesn't turn it off, so it's not as draconian as it was before. And you can set the timer with the shipper. You can ask the shipper, how long do you want the doors open? Uh, before I, I, I have this system that gets set back. So I'm hoping one of you could commercialize this. I believe this could be a great uh, opportunity for, for sales to companies with large bay doors. Now, this is our emissions. This is, uh, this is the, the best chart here of the whole presentation. You see the yellow going smaller and smaller from left to right. That's our electricity. And then the orange, that's the uh, carbon emissions from natural gas. And around the 2007 mark is when I put in that system for the, the bay doors. So you can see the dramatic reduction. And also, too, I'll touch on this later, but 2006, we only had this one single bay. And, and then 2007, we added the new bay. So even though we've more than doubled our footprint, we've got this uh, reduction going on. We even track uh, an employee commute. That's what the light blue is. So even uh, our staff. Even though we've increased our staff, I believe by around 
that light blue zone has actually gotten smaller. So 77% reduction while we grew our business. We also joined Sustainable Waterloo. I believe Sustainable Waterloo, this type of group you'll find in Toronto and Hamilton, even up uh, in Timmins and in, in North Bay. Uh, this was a great uh, group to join because they focused on training our staff. Uh, we actually received one year, we received the award for most attended uh, by a company. So we, we uh, had our staff attend almost every monthly uh, session they had. We installed a, a system to actually monitor, I believe it was uh, 12 systems in our plant. So here you see one day, this was uh, October uh, 23rd, 2013. It showed the system, uh, how much we were using by machine. Um, we actually also have graphs where we can actually look at it live. Um, so we can turn off some of these and, and see, for example, when a compressor is coming on live. So this is very important to us. I think all most companies of a certain size have the ability to at least monitor their facilities if one monitor. Um, so if you approach your hydro utility, just ask them if there's no cost to it. Uh, if you're a certain size, you automatically have access to this data. Uh, for your facility as a whole. We actually went and drilled down to these 12 work centers. This is an example of one of the units on the wall that actually uh, uh, records that data and shows it to us on the screen. Here is the chart. This is for a compressor. This is for the Kaiser compressor at the end of our building. You can see the Kaiser compressor turns on, fills the, uh, fills the tank, and then turns off. I even get uh, alerts to my phone when the doors are open. So I can, uh, I think on a Sunday, somebody showed up. I saw the door was open. Uh, I called in and it was one of my fellows just dropping off some wood. And here's the sensor telling me when they've exceeded the 10 minute uh, agreed upon time. So I know when, when uh, there's something going on in the shop, I can say, hey, why is that door, why was that door left open? Here's a, uh, just a chart showing our usage based on those, uh, those 11 centers. And it helps us to really uh, see, hey, which one should we focus on next? If we didn't know that, uh, we would have focused on a good example here. The um, you see the B900 at the bottom left, the gray zone. We thought that's our biggest press. It's a 900 ton, 20 foot press. We thought that would overshadow everything in our plant. But when we uh, actually did the the charting and actually the logging of their usage, it was only seven percent of our facility. And we thought, how's that possible? It's, it has a massive hydraulic motor. This machine dwarfs anything we have. And then we realized. All the other machines were running uh, at higher speeds. They were small, more nimble machines. This one is a large press where they're using two cranes to bring the part in. The press actually only runs maybe 15% uh, of the day, whereas these other machines, the Torret, the Torch, the B350, these are all vending centers. They're running at higher rates. So even though they're smaller, a fraction of the size, they're using as much as the this big machine. So it's great to have this data. We wouldn't be doing a the proper, uh, we wouldn't be focusing our efforts and our proper equipment if we didn't have this data. Uh, here's my, my team, that's me on the left, and my, uh, Jerry and Vinit, they're the ones looking after these, these projects. Uh, every year we have a goal to reduce our overall usage by 10%, and then we look at our top uh, two machines using electricity that you saw of the 12 centers we're logging, those we have a goal of reducing each the top two users by 20%. Um, we're not partisan. We both had uh, provincial. Uh, we've had uh, f uh, progressive, progressive conservatives and liberals here. Uh, Minister Catherine McKenna was here just a year and a half ago. Uh, Minister Goodyear was here the year before. Um, we've had uh, funding for some of our projects. I think we received seventy-five thousand for one of our best projects, which was a system that uh, consolidated our paperwork uh, in shipping and it, it really increased increased the the uh, the customer satisfaction and that was a that was a project that was both sustainable and business minded when you saw the photograph of my facility you would have noticed there's nothing no solar no geothermal no wind uh, I'm, i support those three technologies but you don't have to do those things at your facility uh, everything we've done is low cost um, it's reproducible it's scalable um, and and i really our biggest takeaway if you were just to, to say Paul I'm going to leave now but this is the, what, what I want to tell you we've done over a hundred sustainability projects hundred the that's our real secret it's not just changing the lights in your plant or putting a different motor or, or uh, having computers turn off at night it's the sum total of all those projects that we've had implemented in the last 15 years 
these projects, some of them are as simple as changing the motors and changing lights. Some of them are subsidies to, to our staff for uh, hybrid vehicles, uh, education subsidies. Maintenance is a big one. I'll touch on that later. Maintenance is a big one that we actually only discovered, I would say, about two thirds of the way through our, our sustainability uh, voyage. Purchasing, uh, for example, all our large uh, uh, single uh, office printers that uh, all in one printers are purchased used. There's no reason to buy a new one. They're a fraction of the cost and they have all the latest technology. Back to this, uh, this, uh, this 37 projects that were, are on our website. As I mentioned, you can apply them to any institution. And when you look at our chart here, the, the reductions are, are incredible, especially when you consider the building has more than doubled in size. And the ex expansion was 128% larger than the original facility. We added uh, the, that 900 ton press, you can see in the bottom right, all the staff are installing it here. Uh, we had people here from Switzerland and Turkey doing that. A lot more lights, a lot, uh, two 10 ton cranes, uh, a tremendous amount of welding machines. Welding machines actually use uh, uh, over, uh, I believe, 1% of power in Ontario. Uh, compressors use 5% of power in Ontario. Here they are operating the, the 20 foot press. Uh, they're bending here a special Hardox 450 plate used in mining. And so if you look at this chart, bearing in mind that we've increased our footprint, business owners have told me, well, if I go apply sustainability to my business, it's going to prevent me from growing and, and increasing my workforce and increasing my sales. It hasn't done that to us at all. In fact, it's allowed us to increase our workforce. And I'll show you the sales and the workforce data later. But we've decreased our footprint. Um, if this was a stock, you would think this company is going under. In fact, our, our financial strength has improved. And I'll uh, go over those numbers later. Now, if you look at the numbers based on square footage, we use 262 tons in the single bay, and then we use only 60 tons in the uh, two bays, which are twice as large. This works out to uh, a 90% reduction per square foot. Now, somebody told me, well, Paul, your numbers will look great, but that electricity that you've reduced, that's not because of anything you've done. It's because Ontario's power is cleaner. Ontario closed all their, their coal plants. Therefore, the emissions per uh, kilowatt is lower. That's why your, your numbers are, are better. And that's, I want to show you that's not, not true. Here's our usage based on gigajoules. That's the actual physical energy that runs through our electrical wires here. You can see our, our energy usage has gone down uh, over the last, uh, let's see here, it's 12, 11, year, 11 years on this chart. So it's not because of the coal plants. And those two, those two numbers uh, uh, are comparable, 77% overall and then we reduce our electricity usage by 72%. Here's an example. Some of you have seen examples like this, but I want to point this out, bring out the maintenance. Maintenance is a big one that I think all businesses, all business types can really look uh, into. So here's a, a compressor we changed. On the left is the original compressor. It was a, about a 20 horsepower. We replaced it with a system that was less than half. After we, we got money from uh, Cambridge Hydro, the cost was $10,500, and we saved this much in electricity every year, so about a quarter of the purchase value. So it's a four-year payback. And here's the, a typical spreadsheet that most business owners would look at. And I want to bring maintenance into this and really show you a real missed opportunity. Uh, so again, a four-year payback. This is the maintenance costs for that original compressor before we switched to the newer compressor that was half the size. And this was one of the reasons we actually changed the compressor. We were paying per every two years the original purchase value of the compressor, which was outrageous. You shouldn't be paying maintenance costs that are that high. By analyzing the numbers, we realized, okay, this is the compressor we need to have looked at. We had a company come in, do an audit, and we took and replaced this compressor with a compressor half the size. Here's, here's the compressor that we put in now. This is the one that you saw earlier. It, when, it's, when it's running, it's up up at the uh, the top there, and then when it's off, it shuts off. The previous compressor was up here, the lines right off the charts. When it was running idle, it was still running. So here's the, the maintenance costs afterwards with the new compressor. Now, here's the average maintenance cost per month, per, sorry, yes, per, uh, per year, and here it is afterwards. You can see the difference is about $4,600. That's 
almost bordering on double what we're saving on electricity. So going back to the spreadsheet, we have the capital cost, we have the incentive from utility, uh, we know that the annual energy is, savings is 2,600. We only had 25% uh, payback, sorry, ROI and four year payback. Now, when you add the maintenance, this number becomes 70%. That's a great return. And the payback now, instead of four years, is 1.43. I know most business owners are looking for a one to two year payback. So now it's very attractive. And I think that's missing from formulas when uh, utilities are trying to get people to switch their, their equipment. They're forgetting to tell them that they can save a lot of money on maintenance. Now our maintenance costs, since we've implemented sustainability as a company, it's almost half. It's a 43% reduction. That's dramatic. So for every $100 we sold, we were, we were spending $2.10 on maintenance. So we reduced that in half. That's, a, that's an incredible number when you approach it with a sustainability mindset. As somebody said, if you don't like the word sustainability or going green, think of it as, as intelligent asset management. You have to manage your assets a lot better. Here's the savings, uh, the way the calculations were, were shown. That's the savings since uh, over the last, uh, let's see, six years. So we were saving 35,000 a year uh, on, the, on the, the maintenance costs. Uh, we we're, uh, at the time we were about uh, four, four million a year. So that's almost 1% to our profit. Our, instead, if our profit was 4%, that would increase our profit to 5%. That's a dramatic increase. Here I threw this in last minute because I, I thought I wanted to show you, for those of you who look at income statements for your businesses, how do you attack uh, maintenance costs? Uh, most people put their maintenance costs into their income statement as one line item. So here you can see this is a typical, this is actually our income statement. But in our system, we actually drill down. We've actually broken the maintenance by all the major work centers. So we can actually see every year, hey, which one of these work centers is causing us the most amount of maintenance costs. Maybe there's an opportunity to also replace it or fine tune it so we can save also electricity. So maintenance and electricity usage or naturally gas usage, those two things are very much related. And here's a close up of all those different places that we looked at. You can see here material handling uh, and the plasma and the rolling machine. Those are the three centers that we would be looking at to improve. Before Doug Ford took over, Ontario is trading uh, natural gas at $18 a ton and we've actually calculated what is it costing us at Veriform. We have calculated that overall every year we're saving this much amount in, in these three sectors. So in energy we're saving 126 a year. Turnover of employees that's that's only based on one employee uh, leaving us. Uh, that's a very conservative figure and maintenance we've already shown you that's 35,000. We're saving 63,000 a year uh, that's nearly doubling uh, our profit uh, for our sector. Uh, Wilfrid Laurier did a study. Our net profit for my sector in 1997 was only 3%, which is very low. Um, so a 60, uh, 63,000, that's 6.3% uh, of our sales. So we went, I dropped our, our GHG guesses by 202 tons. We know our savings. That works out to 900 tons, sorry, $900 per ton is our cost. If you go back to Greg's slide, he had the one showing, I think, about uh, $2,000 using the $2,000 per metric ton of GHG emissions when using those electric buses and electric vehicles. We, we've calculated ours as a company that uh, for every ton that we eliminate, we're saving $900. Uh, so those 202 tons uh, times 900 is what we're saving every year. That's a lot larger figure than the $18 a ton that Ontario is trading uh, emissions at. That's two and a half million extra revenue uh, for the last, uh, I believe it was 10 years or 14 years. I, I can't remember the calculation. That's an incredible amount of revenue. If you consider our sales would be around 4 million a year. We've even looked at our, our uh, usage of energy based on sales per kilowatt hour. That might be something that some of you can actually use in your present uh, your analysis of your companies is how much are sales are we doing per kilowatt hour? We used to sell six dollars of uh, widgets parts to customers for every kilowatt hour we consumed. Today it's nineteen dollars. That's that's incredible. We actually trademarked the the phrase sales per kilowatt hour. That's how we felt that was a great uh, way of of uh, benchmarking your usage. Here's the numbers you can see from two thousand seven two thousand seventeen. So 612, 
1324 average, and then finally 1955. That's not because uh, 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 energy uh, uh, costs went up. Uh, it, can't, it didn't go 300% up in the 10 years. And that's why we increased our building size by double. So the last slide, the five points, I promised we'd get back to them. Job creation, uh, we have increased our job, uh, our number of staff by over 40%. In fact, we're right now almost 50%. We are doing a lot of work for uh, nuclear and uh, defense right now. We're very busy. Last year was our best year ever. Um, uh, our profit-wise, we've tripled our profit. It's not all, of course, sustainability, but it's definitely a, a major factor in our, our competitiveness, our profit. Our physical footprint has increased by 120%. Our maintenance costs, you saw, have gone down by 43%, even though our building is larger and we have a lot more equipment. And we're selling a lot more for every unit of energy. So the idea that you can't grow your business or your workforce uh, and grow your sales when you're using sustainability as a mindset is completely wrong. We've shown here with these five numbers that we're, we're doing the opposite. If we didn't go sustainable or didn't, didn't uh, make sustainability a main consideration in our business uh, uh, day here, we wouldn't be in business. Uh, we survived uh, last recession because we had all the energy savings uh, boosting our, uh, our income. So the big secret, 100, over 100 plus projects in the last 14 or 15 years, um, doing one or two is not gonna get you the financial benefit uh, of uh, sustainability. You've gotta really keep having your team constantly attacking it and doing the projects. And now we, run out, we are actually running out of projects. Now our big challenge is actually maintaining those, those projects, make, making sure that they're consistently uh, being optimized and still running. Uh, most of them are self-managed. We don't have to do anything. A new motor doesn't have to be managed. It keeps running until you have to replace it. So there you go. That's the numbers. Um, and there's our facility. I, I welcome anybody who wants to uh, contact us for a tour of our plant. Uh, we can show you. We've identified all the places in our shop where we've uh, done our initiatives. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Appreciate that. That was great. Uh, there was just uh, one question that actually came in during the presentation, and we are pretty much out of time. Um, could you actually move to the last slide there for me? Uh, the, the, the one that I gave. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um, the, the, the last there. Thank you. Um, the only question I had was, Greg, it came in here. If somebody wanted to connect with a student who could help them do some of this in their plan, what would their next steps be? Uh, well, so pretty sure. So I would say coming out of this presentation, the easiest thing is um, I would say connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, okay. we've, we've got an opportunity. Obviously, we've got a more formal process, right, where we engage. But uh, one of the easiest ways is just to connect to uh, someone who is part of the faculty um, at McMaster and we'll, we'll uh, find a way to make it work. Great. Well, gentlemen, thank you both. That was, uh, I mean, there was tons of information there as far as the overview, as you promised, and then practicality as far as exactly what you've done, Paul, in your facility, and most importantly, the numbers behind what you've done, the results you've achieved. So thank you both, gentlemen, for this. I look forward to everybody uh, joining us next Thursday, 11 a.m. If you'd like to further the discussion uh, around this important topic, uh, be happy to uh, have you join us. And again, watch for my email with further information. Uh, and also, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our next What's Next Thought Leadership is on April 22nd. We're going to be talking about adaptive leadership in the face of crisis. So I hope you'll be able to join us. Uh, make sure you put that into your calendar, Thursday, April 22nd at 11 a.m. So again, from all of us here at NGEN, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, if you would like more information on this topic or you're looking to learn, aside from connecting with Greg, you could also check out our AMP Up program. If you go to our website, uh, you'll see there's some programs and, and training in there. Uh, that may be able to help as well. So thanks again, gentlemen, for joining us. Thank you for joining us. Everybody stay safe and have a great rest of your day. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. All right.